This is John Daly on the deck of the Mayflower at Plymouth Harbor, England. High tide and sailing time is here this sixth day of September 1620. But this tragic ship with its company of 102 desperate, frightened, hounded souls who are displacing their persons from the old world to the new has not yet sailed. These pilgrims, these refugees for religious freedom and civil rights are still tied to Europe by a Gordian knot of heart-breaking difficulties. And unless these outlaws from the Church of England can cut that knot before the ebb tide sinks them deeper into danger, the Mayflower may never sail at all for the colony of Northern Virginia, recently renamed New England. The afternoon sun is throwing shadows of gloom on the town of Plymouth behind me. Soon will be... Plymouth Harbor, England, September 6th, 1620. You are there. The Exodus of the Pilgrims out of the noose of oppression and persecution into the arms of an angry sea and a desolate winter continent. CBS takes you back to a little-known but fateful moment in American history. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. You are there. You are there is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, Plymouth Harbor, England, September 6th, 1620. The deck of the Mayflower and John Daly. Voyage to the new world and to freedom. Twice they have been delayed for repairs to the sister ship, the Speedwell, which has finally been withdrawn, crowding all into the Mayflower. And now at last, they must sail with this tide. For today, the weather is good. Tomorrow or the day after, it may be bad enough to prevent their sailing at all, for winter is close upon them. Another delay and the Mayflower would have to face the grisly gales of an autumnal sea and the far from certain arrival in a strange land gripped in the fury of winter. These refugees have already lost their summer chances and to lose more is suicide. Here with me at our CBS microphone is Christopher Jones, the master of the Mayflower. Captain Jones is one of the most respected shipmasters in all of England. He's one-fourth owner of the Mayflower a middle-aged, rather sedate man, a strict, strong, dependable citizen. These pilgrims will be in good hands if they succeed in getting away today. But right now, the face of Captain Jones is troubled with deep and anxious lines. Captain Jones, what's holding the Mayflower up? Why don't you sail? Sir? We will sail. But how can you say that, Captain? Your canvas is still tied down, and the tide is at its height. Well, I expect my orders momentarily, and we'll sail. And... Who are those orders to come from, sir? From the pilgrim elders who are locked in the cabin? Yes, as soon as they settle their last-minute differences with Mr. Weston, the representative of the adventurers. But who are these adventurers, Captain? What is their business with these refugees? The adventurers, Mr. Daly, are a group of men who are venturing not their persons on this expedition, but their capital. Well, Captain, do you know what the last-minute differences between these moneylenders and the pilgrims uh, are? I can't say, sir. Something to do with the contract they agreed upon for the sharing of profits from possible trade in the new world. As if we haven't got enough trouble, Mr. Weston arrives ten minutes ago and closets himself in the cabin and holds up our departure. But as soon as these differences are settled and Mr. Weston gets off the ship, you will say... I certainly hope so, sir. Hope? But only hope? Why? Well, my passengers say they'll not sail without their charter from King James. But what charter? I hadn't heard about that. Why, the charter guaranteeing them civil and religious freedom from the king's authority in the new world. Uh, Sir Robert Norton, that's His Majesty's emissary, gave his word that he would arrive today. But, Captain, suppose he doesn't come before the tide has ebbed. Well, only Providence can answer that question, so not I. And now, if you'll excuse one, me, One I've more been... question, Captain, please. Uh, are all the elders on board the Mayflower now? Uh, they're in the cabin. I'm going there now, sir. Well, would you care to state who exactly of the elders is on board? Well, in the cabin are William Bradford, Deacon Cushman, John Carver, and uh, perhaps some others. And would you care to say, Captain, if the elder William Brewster is on board? Uh, uh, 
Now, Mr. Daly, it was your desire and your promise to ask but one question. Now, I believe I've kept my bargain. Now, if you please, well, sir, thank I you very much, talk. Captain Jones. The master of the Mayflower is entering the cabin, and we really didn't expect him to answer our questions as to the whereabouts of William Brewster, the ruling elder of these departing refugees. Master Brewster is a hunted fugitive with a price on his head. He is at this moment, and for the past ten years he has been, the object of an international manhunt instituted by His Majesty. He's been accused of printing a book entitled Perth Assembly, and His Majesty has denounced that book as being, and we quote, an atrocious and seditious libel written with scorn and reproach against the king and his bishops. Printed copies of the book were smuggled from Holland into Scotland in French wine vats. Now, there's a flurry of excitement on the deck of the Mayflower. It's caused by the arrival of a royal carriage. It's speeding at a dangerous pace down the wharf right now, and it must be the arrival of Sir Robert Norton, the king's secretary of state. The carriage is pulling up now at the boards leading up here to the deck of the Mayflower. Door is opening. Yes, it is. It's Sir Robert. It's the official who has intervened on behalf of the pilgrims to secure them the King James Charter for the New World. He's coming up the planks now and must pass our CBS microphone on his way to the captain's cabin. I'm going to try to get a hold of him. Sir Robert! Oh, Sir Robert! Stand aside, please. Sir Robert, have the pilgrims got their charter, sir? Do you carry the charter? I said stand aside, please. Yes, sir. Master William Bradford, Elder Bradford, has appeared at the cabin door to greet Sir Robert. Both men have gone in. The cabin door has been shut in our faces, but we hope that at least one of the difficulties besetting these poor, desperate refugees will be surmounted. This charter is vital to them. Without it, they cannot live under the protection of the king in the new world and enjoy liberty of conscience. You know, this Mayflower seems a pitifully inadequate vessel to brave the vast terrors of the Atlantic, particularly at this time of the year. She's no more than a hundred feet, say, from bow to stern and perhaps... 20 to 25 feet at the beam from port to starboard. She has plied good wine and bad wine from every port in France in the past and landed it safely on the London River. And on some occasions she's carried luxurious taffetas and satins and stockings and coney skins. In fact, the aroma of her last wine cargo still pleasantly escapes from her hold. But on this, her first Atlantic crossing... The Mayflower's cargo has ironically turned from riches to rags. This time, she carries an unusual cargo, men, women, and crying children. And up at the bow of the ship, Ken Roberts, surrounded by these children, seems to have something to say. So go ahead, Ken. Ready? Sing. And the earth did shake and quake and stirred the ground of the The children you hear doing their distracted best to sing one of the tongue-twisting psalms of the pilgrims are being led by a pretty young miss, and she's doing her distracted best to keep them quiet. Good children, very good. Hush, children. Would you tell us your name, please, miss? Priscilla, Priscilla Mullins. And how old are you, Miss Priscilla? Eighteen. Eighteen. And is your father a religious dissenter, a pilgrim? Oh, no, sir. My father is a shopkeeper from Dorking, Surrey. We are French Huguenots. Well, why, why is your family fleeing England if you are not religious dissenters? Only 40-some odd of the people aboard the Mayflower are religious dissenters. The rest of us are sailing for other urgent reasons. Miss Priscilla, what are those urgent reasons? My father says that there are many on board this ship that flee not the persecution of their souls, but the persecution of their bodies. For as you know, sir, all over Europe, they see the grim and gaunt face of poverty and hunger coming upon them like an armed man. I understand. And, Miss Priscilla, who are these children you are shepherding? These children here? Four of them are orphans. Orphans on the Mayflower? Yes, poor waifs of London town. Poor orphans dragged off quite as if they were debtors or criminals and sentenced to exile in the colonies. But by whose authority? Ask the Lord Mayor of London and his bishop. Oh, I see. Less mouths to feed in London. I suppose so. I see. And, um, what is, what is your name, young man? Russell. Russell? Russell what? Russell with the devil. Russell with the devil? 
Well, that's a good name. My, my, my brother has a good name, too. I'm sure he has. What is it? Love. What, what's that? Love of God. Don't you? Well... My I... father does. He He's a great man. My mother says not to tell where he is, but I know. Russell, hush. I won't tell, Miss Purcell. I, I promised. My, my father is in prison, but he'll escape and fight the Indians with love and me. Oh, I see. You and love are two big Indian fighters. And uh, what is your father's name? William Brewster. Indeed. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rassel. Miss Priscilla, I didn't know these two were Master Brewster's children. Oh, yes, yes, there I... are two more of us. Two big sisters, Fear and Patience. Of course, Rassel, of course. Fear and Patience. Very appropriate names for the children of William Brewster. Don't you agree, Miss Priscilla? Yes. My fear is that we will not sail. And as for our patience, that is at an end and so is our money. My father has sold his shop and all our worldly goods. We have burned all, all our bridges behind us. Of of I'm, I'm sorry, there's a man coming through carrying a barrel. I told you before, miss, to get these children out of here. Do you want their heads bashed in with a barrel? You'll bash no one, you... You out! I'm trying my best, can't you see? Come, children. Thank you, Miss Priscilla. Thank you, children. Children and wenches, as if we didn't have enough. Hey, you. Maybe you know when we're going to get underway. Soon, I hope. What's your name? Alden. John Alden. That barrel you just put down must be pretty heavy. What's in it? The body of William Brewster. In little pieces, I presume. <laughs> That would be a story for you, eh? Uh, but it's only beer. Beer for the sober pilgrims? Would you expect them to drink ye plain water? Uh, it's a prolific source of human ills. Oh, they'll remain healthy as long as I take care of their kegs. Or I'm not a good cooper. Are, uh, are you one of the pilgrims? Yeah. I'm a cooper out of Harwich. I'm hired on by them to care for their beer, their plain water, and uh, their strong water. That's my task on this voyage. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the voyage? Mm, uh, home again for me. I'm hired on for only a year. But if they let this tide run out much longer, I'll never go. Well, enough of this chatter. This barrel of beer wasn't meant for the sun. Thank you, John Alden. Mr. Alden handles that heavy barrel of beer as if it were kindling wood. Though he can't be more than 20, he's tall, blonde, and powerful... The kind of a fellow who's rough and ready with his hands. No doubt that's why the pilgrims hired him. That's why they... Oh, I see the door of the Mayflower's cabin has opened. Sir Robert Norton has just come out, so back to John Daly. Sir Robert, the King's Secretary of State, is willing to tell us now what has happened. Sir Robert, has the charter been granted? I should like to present, if I may, the mind of His Majesty in this matter. Of course, sir, but did His he... His Majesty asked me what profits there may be of such an adventure. By profits, His Majesty meant profits to the realm, I presume. Uh, yes, and I answered fishing. Fishing? Yes, fishing. The departing pilgrims would engage in fishing in the colonies. And did that uh, satisfy the king, sir? <laughs> it amused him. And he replied, so God have me soul, it's an honest trade. It was the apostle's own calling. I see the king demonstrated his knowledge of theology and of the trade of fishing. Yes. But did he, sir, formally consent to the request for the charter? His majesty agreed not to molest them should they depart. But he would issue no official seal of protection. Then the charter was not granted. Oh, I wouldn't say that. His majesty referred them to the bishop of London and the, uh, the archbishop of Canterbury. Good day, sir. Good day, and thank you, Sir Robert. The King's Secretary of State is leaving the Mayflower, but... One moment. Oh, Mr. Bradford, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, Master William Bradford, in the absence of William Brewster, is the ruling elder of these pilgrims. Uh, a rather young elder, I would say, wouldn't you, Mr. Bradford? I am honored that you call me an elder. I am 31 years old, but we pilgrims age rapidly in the king's protection. Well, how old is Master Brewster, sir? Master Brewster is uh, past 50. Oh, I see. Yes, he, he's the only, shall we say, real elder in our company. The rest of us are mostly around 30. Well, as the present ruling elder, Master Bradford, are you going to follow his majesty's suggestion that you see the Bishop of London and the Archbishop of Canterbury about the charter? Have my nose split down the middle? No, thank you. 
I believe we know what the answer of these venerable gentlemen of the Anglican Church would be. But, sir, how can you sail without the charter? To be sure, Mr. Daly, the charter is of great moment to us. Let us not be of too simple a mind about it. Even if we had a seal as broad as a house floor, what is there to prevent the king, if he were disposed to wrong us, from reaching out his long arm even to our new life in America and there claiming us under his civil and religious authority? Well, then that means that you will sail without the charter. We sail without the charter. We sail. No, no, I'll not sail. Hush, I'll not sail. I'll not sail without our Take her away quickly. Take her away quickly. Take her away quickly. Master Bradford, who is that poor woman? My, my wife. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. But you are leaving your children behind? Our only child. He's scarcely five. My wife has been mad with grief. Forgive her, please. For she, too, is but a child. But, Master Bradford, other children are going. Why, just a, a short while ago, we learned that Rassel and Love, the children of William Brewster, are on board. Yes, but there's no space for all to go. We'd planned to sail on two ships. We are now all crowded onto one. And some, some like my own child, must be left behind. Because they are most unfit to bear the brunt of this hard adventure. And thus, like Gideon's army, we are divided. As if the Lord thought we few too many for the great work he had to do. But now, sir, you'll forgive me. I must return to our business with you. Well, just one more question, please, Master Bradford. Yes? Uh, before you go, could you tell us exactly what the difficulty is between you and the adventurers? Yes. We had agreed that the fruits of our labor and all profits got from traffic, fishing, and trade should be shared equally with the adventurers for a period of seven years. Yes? Yes. But these bloodsuckers are not content to enslave a man for seven years. Now they demand seven days of the week. Well, how many days had you agreed to work? Five. And the other two for prayer and for our own profit to build our homes. And moreover, at the end of seven years, they now demand that our houses and lots be divided with them. But, but surely, sir, the land and houses built in the wilderness will be but a trifle to these adventurers. They do not think so. The division will be a great discouragement to us. We will have to borrow hours from our sleep to build our houses. But they, ha, they ask if we will sleep better in the stinking London prisons. Well, that's too bad, Master Bradford, but uh, what are you going to do? Do? What can we do? We have sacrificed everything we possess to pay for this journey. Shall we turn back now, penniless and destitute and at the mercy of the star chamber and torture rack? We are like the children of Israel. But the Lord will yet guide us through this sea of oppression. Master Bradford has gone back into the cabin again. And the people around me here on the deck of the Mayflower have heard the reality of their misfortune. They're discussing it with grim faces and in low tones. And certainly these people have a reason to be grim and unhappy. So many misadventures have befallen them since they first set out for the new, the new world. A penny, you know, is worth a pound to these poor folk. There's not a wealthy man among them. There's not a patch of purple on these passengers, although they do not wear somber clothes, as many believe. Rather, it's the gay apparel of Lincoln greens and russet browns, the same splash of color that you would see on the streets in London town. Indeed, the missing elder, William Brewster, has been known to wear at his pleasure a red cap, a white cap, a quilted cap or a dandy-laced cap, together with a violet coat and green drawers. Oh, Ken Roberts, up at the Mayflower's bow, has a passenger with two dogs. So over to Ken Roberts. The dogs you hear barking are a great master and a small spaniel. They belong to a man here beside me who has been quietly sitting on a barrel reading the Bible. He has kindly agreed to put aside the holy book for a few moments and speak with us. Sir, why are you taking these two dogs along with you to America? Well, why not? Since my wife is not going, a man must have some form of companionship. Oh, I see, but what will you do with the two dogs? Do? Why, I shall hunt with them in the wilderness. Oh, hunt what, sir? Lions. Lions, I see. What is your name, sir? Richard the Lionhearted? You jest. I am John Goodman. My wife's name is Sarah. Sarah Goodman, just these past few months. Forgive me, sir just married and you're leaving your bride behind? Oh, not of my choice, sir. I left her behind in Delft Haven, Holland. There was not room for all on our little craft. 
the speed well. Now I am fortunate to be on the Mayflower, for all men know the treachery of the Speedwell's captain, who claims the boat is unseaworthy. Well, isn't it? Didn't it force you to turn back twice and delay you for a month? Uh, I will tell you a secret, Mr. Uh, what is your name, sir? Roberts. Yes, I will tell you a secret, Mr. Roberts. The captain of the Speedwell and his men are afraid of remaining a winter in the wilderness. They are? Yes, but we're not afraid. We fear the wilderness less than the languishing death which we dissenters suffered in the London prisons, where many of us have perished by hunger and cold, and by long and hard imprisonment and held without bail in black dungeons where I could not see my hand at noonday. Oh, yes, I remember too well the star chamber and how we were whipped and pilloried in the presence of the court. Look, look, I had one ear sliced off, you see. So some have had their noses split down the middle and the letters... S.S. branded on their foreheads. S.S. Ah, uh, yes, I see you know what that means. Stirrer of sedition. If reading this Bible in the common tongue makes me a stirrer of sedition, it might make me lose my other ear. But have no fear. Have no fear. I'm safe. We are free. I'm sailing to the new world. The new world where a husbandman may sing the psalms at his plow and a weaver warble the words of the book at his shuttle. Nay, nay, more. There in America, it will not be many years before a boy that driveth the donkey will know more of the scripture than the Archbishop of Canterbury. And now, sir, may I speak a poem? Uh, yes, if you like. I sit upon the deck. Book is in my hand. Do not fear. Heaven is near, I say. By water as by land. I sit upon the deck. Oh, excuse Book me, is in my hand. there's a disturbance on the wharf, a fight of some kind. I see John Daly down there, so down to the wharf. It was at fight ten. One of the ship's passengers walked off the Mayflower with all his family and all of his belongings, and another man who appears to be a soldier accused him of deserting and tried to stop him. A fight flared up, and, well, it's, it's almost over now, I hope, and we'll try to find out what it's all about. Now, look, one, one at a time, please, please, one at a time. And now, sir, suppose you tell us why you're leaving the Mayflower. He is a man of coward, sir, if he fears that his children will be exposed to the miseries of the land and the colonies. But can a man bear to see his loved ones die of famine and, and nakedness and want? We are well provisioned. Provisioned, sir. Please, 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 let him speak. Well provisioned, are we? We are in such a strait at present that we now scarce have any butter to brave the winter. That's not true. We have no oil. Not a hide of leather to mend a shoe. Uh, and are we provisioned against the change of air, sir? And the strange diet and the drinking of strange water that will affect our bodies with sore sicknesses and grievous diseases? But there is a physician and surgeon on board the Mayflower. Two of them, in fact. And can he save us from the savages? We have muskets, sir. Muskets. How many muskets against a cruel and barbarous and most treacherous people who are most furious in their rage. For, for I have heard that they are content not only to kill, but to like to torment men by playing them alive with the shells of fishes. How do you know all of this? I know, I know. They, they, they cut up a body piecemeal. They boil it over the coals and they eat the colors of flesh in their sight while still the body lives. You seem to be well informed, sir, about places you've not been to. Aye, sir, verily I am informed. I am informed... I am informed that the 1,200 immigrants that sailed from England these past three months, a thousand died on the voyage or after their arrival in the Virginia colonies. Now answer that, Captain Shrimp. Who are you calling Captain Shrimp? You get the moment, please. Just a moment. I'll shred him to pieces. Give a livid libel, please. No one can call me Captain Shrimp. Just a moment. My name is Captain Miles Standish. Well, then, you are calm down, Captain Miles Standish. Captain Shrimp, will you? Aye, Shrimp. Captain Standish is a short, stubby fellow with a flaming head of red hair that now matches the crimson rage in his face. Well, what are you captain of, Captain Standish? I, I am a military man. Uh, you are a shrimp. I fought with a Dutch against Spain. And any flea that calls me Captain Shrimp will find that I am a little chimney that is quickly fired. Oh, and should this, this cowardly deserter, this pernicious poor Captain Standish, now Captain Standish, please. By what authority, sir, did you try to dissuade this man abandoning the voyage? Are you an elder? No. But I've been chosen by the elders to preserve order and lead the pilgrim army in the new world. You mean you're going to protect them against the savages? I will protect them against any enemy. 
man or beast. Well, I presume then, Captain Standish, that you are one of these pilgrims. No, sir. I am a Roman Catholic. My task is simply to protect these people, even from such a deserter as this one. I am not a deserter, sir. Please, please, please. You've had your say. He is stirring up fear among us. But we will be strong, even though today we are weak. With the help of God, there will come a day when the bees will have honey in their hives. And then they will also have stings in their tails. I will not Excuse me. The Mayflower cabin door has been flung open, and the agent for the adventurers, Mr. Weston, is striding swiftly across the deck. He's coming off the ship and coming down the boards here to the wharf. He looks very angry. Perhaps I can stop him to say a word. Mr. Weston! Mr. Weston! No comment. But, sir, is the Mayflower sailing? Let me buy, please. Just one question, please, sir. Has the contract been settled? There is no contract. But, Mr. Weston... I have no time. If they leave, they stand on their own legs. That's Mr. Bradford, sir. He's come out of the cabin and he's coming down the board. Let him come. He'll do no business with me. Bloodsuckers, are we? Are my investors to be called bloodsuckers simply because they want to protect their money? Weston, the new contract you propose is fitter for thieves and bond slaves than honest men. I bleed for you, Master Bradford. But I'll not risk another penny of the adventurer's capital. I understand. He that ventureth his money hath more power than he that ventureth his person. We've been through all that. If you've nothing newer to say, then let me by. We have a new proposal. Then speak it and be quick. Very well. Here it is. In return for two days and every seven to build our homes, we will agree, if necessary, to guarantee your profits, though it take us more than seven years. Will that suffice? Then you guarantee our profits. That's reasonable. I think the adventurers will agree. I accept. So be it. Be gone, then, and let us sail. Godspeed. Captain, we sail at once. All on board. Godspeed, Master Bradford. Bradford is gone up the boards. Those are on the wharf here are hurrying up after him. Captain Jones has given the order to raise the hook. There's a whirlwind of activity up there on the deck of the Mayflower. Sailors are shouting, leaping up into the rigging. The sails are going up beginning to belly out into the wind. Captain Jones is wasting not a moment. He means to catch the last full strength of this tide. And now, a surprise in these last minutes before sailing, Elder William Brewster, the fugitive leader of the pilgrims, the man with a price on his head, is on board the Mayflower and with Ken Roberts. So now, back to the cabin. William Brewster is here, sitting across the table from us in the Mayflower's cabin as it gets underway to the new world. Master Brewster, will you tell us where you have been? Some say I have been to London, and some to Scotland, and still others to Holland. All are correct, but for the past hour, as you know, Mr. Roberts, I've been sitting in the hold of the Mayflower. Master Brewster, how do you feel now that finally you're about to sail for a new land? We are departing on a great venture. In the new world, we will establish a new form of living with ourselves and with God. I fervently pray that maybe next year, God willing, the Mayflower will return, perhaps with a cargo of salt fish and pelts, and sell them at a fair profit. And then when she sails again to America, many more families will go with her. Our men will build their own houses and till their own fields, and our women will weave Sunday clothes for their own families. We will all enter our own church and worship in our own way. Please, God. A happy success on your hopeful voyage. And now, Master Brewster, I must go ashore, so Godspeed again. And back to John Daly on the wharf. The lines have been cast off. Captain Jones is urging his crew on to hurry. And there it goes. The Mayflower is sailing. The people here on the dock are waving and weeping. It's a noisy, but at the same time, a tragic scene. Many of these people will not see their friends and relatives for perhaps years. The Mayflower, her sails filling in the wind, is heaving through the water, making her way towards the catwater and the sound, bound for the New World and New England. The sun is setting, the sun is setting against the rolling white clouds. September 6th, 1620. The pilgrims sail for America to establish the first colony founded on civil and religious liberty.